which I guess to many in the permanent ruling class makes him just annoying. He just won't go away. Congressman Paul, good to speak with you again. Thank you, Jerry. Good to be with you. I uh, I, I have watched uh, with with uh, with some great joy at others' consternation that you continue to gain traction, uh, moving into the top tier, continuing to raise a lot of money. And a, a lot of people are saying, okay, that would never happen. But now that that has happened, now you've reached this political glass ceiling, 19%, never to go any further. You've absolutely peaked. And uh, I would have to say that uh, they're probably going to have to eat those words, too. Well, we're optimistic, and, uh, you know, the movement here in the last month or two uh, has been a reflection of what we've been doing because we've been spending a lot of time in Iowa and as New Hampshire and as well as Nevada. But uh, this this uh, reflection of the polls today was a reflection of what we sort of knew. When they do these national polls, they're not exactly a reflection of exactly what's happening on those probable votes and the organization that we have. So. Uh, I, I feel pretty good about the way things are going. Were you too far ahead of the uh, the curve, Congressman, with regard to things like uh, auditing the Fed? Um, because a lot of people didn't know what the Fed was, didn't know what the Fed did. And when you were talking about things like auditing the Fed, uh, people were like, what the heck is he talking about? But now that others are talking about it and equally concerned as you are about our monetary policy – our debts and our deficits and what we're going to try and do to avoid generational bankruptcy is the rest of not just the candidates, but the constituency and the voters as a whole catching up with where you were many, many, many years ago. Yeah, and there, there's a reason for this because uh, there's been some of us talking about this for 30, 40 years, especially even right after the Bretton Woods broke down and the Fed uh, gained so much power to create money at will, and there was no uh, auditing, no uh, uh, no oversight from the Congress, which there should be. But uh, as long as things seemed to be rocking along okay and the credit was good in the country and, and the recessions weren't severe, they just as soon forget about it. But now they've been forced to think about it, and that's why the whole world has changed since 2008. As a matter of fact, it was in major transition from seven to eight because we did get a lot of attention in 07 about the Federal Reserve and, and talked about uh, the uh, impending problems. And then in 08, when it became very evident, then a lot of people started saying, you know, we better look at this. And now I think it's up to about 65% or more of American people say that we should know more about the Fed. They don't quite understand it well enough to say we have to get rid of it, but they understand it enough that it's it's really very bad not for us to know what they're doing. If they can deal in trillions and trillions of dollars and not have to uh, report to anybody, then there's something seriously wrong. I, I look at leverage ratios as an indication of where we're going going forward. The consumer's leverage ratio, the debt to equity, debt to income, uh, we're still probably five to seven years away from consumers unwinding their debt to help to spur on job creation through the consumption of goods and services. Corporations were leveraged about 30 to 1. The Fed, in its latest uh, analysis, 51 to 1, with $58 billion of reserves pledged against $2.7 trillion dollars of push button money uh if there's a two percent drop in the underlying securities the velvet elvises that they've put as collateral for this printing of this money the fed is technically wiped out now i would have to think that based upon the collapse of lehman four elected governments collapsing over in europe two in the last week greece and italy that there would be more people on capitol hill like yourself that read the tea leaves for what they are and say we have to do something but yet this dirty dozen debt super committee doesn't seem to be able to understand the ramifications of what has happened is happening and could happen to us if we don't get serious yeah and you know if it were a company i think we could short it and uh it would probably be pretty safe because i think you're right it's uh it, it can't operate this way. And even now, it's, it's, uh, it, we might not have to wait very long because there's no real solvency to it because 
uh, this uh, this ratio that they have is all dependent. They keep it going all, only because the world still has a, a bit of a trust in the dollar. They're using the dollar to bail out everybody. You know, Bernanke said the other day that he stands behind. He's he's ready to act if Europe gets into any more trouble. Well, how many people can you bail out with a dollar that's being downgraded by you know the rate rating agencies? So it's um, there, there's a trust in the dollar that's undeserved. And one of these days, the country, the world is going to wake up and say that uh, everybody's going to get out of the currencies. Right now, they're still willing to uh, put a little bit of confidence in the dollar, but but it cannot last. It, uh, it's just impossible. And there seems to be some uh, fellow Republican candidates of yours that are starting to put some trust in some of the things that you've said that they're now coming around to. Rick Perry got a standing O when he was talking about how we have to reduce all our foreign uh, uh, monies. Uh, to zero and then start take a look at who we're allocating those resources to and are we getting a return on our, on our investment. Auditing the Fed was echoed by Newt Gingrich. Uh, foreign uh, policy issues uh, being seconded by Mitt Romney, Rick Perry and others. And a lot of seems like a lot of the other Republicans up there are coming around to a lot of the positions that you've consistently had over time. Is is this just a forced epiphany on their part because they're coming face to face with this economic reality? No, I think, I think what they were doing was a, purely a political statement uh, because they know it's popular and they talk and they talked about zeroing out and then working back on on the foreign aid. Well, foreign aid is is very bad. I don't vote for any of it. I don't believe any of it. But it's rather minor compared to the overseas expenditure involved in in our empire that we operate, being in 130 countries and 900 bases and being in these wars. That's where the big money is. They're not talking about that. They're talking at the same on the same evening where they say that's cut out foreign aid. Uh, they're talking about expanding our our militarism around the world, you know, and, and talking about taking on Iran. Just this week, nobody hardly said a word. Uh, uh, Obama says we got to put troops in Australia. I mean, what do we need troops in Australia for? I mean, we can't we can't even afford to feed our people back home and provide jobs. And over there, we're shipping more troops to Australia uh, and, and looking for uh, provoking something with China. That makes no sense. They're not talking about. It. They're they're talking about the old-fashioned foreign aid, and they didn't say stop it. What they said we'll we'll reassess it all. And after we reassess it, we'll give them that portion that we think they deserve. With regard to us stationing military Marines and Navy down in Australia, in, in Darwin, which is the Pearl Harbor of Australia, because more bombs landed on Darwin than uh, Pearl Harbor in World War II. But I went through a speech that Hillary Clinton gave as a precursor to Obama's visit. And she gave this speech, and I went through the speech, and I was highlighting all the instances where they were talking about promoting balance and economic growth, where we have to look at increased investment, diplomatic, economic, strategic. We have to look at economic architecture, economic issues that will be front and center in our relationships in the region. It seems to me, Congressman, that we're now sending the military down to guard the mall, so to speak, which would be to guard the economic interest of the United States, of businesses, in that region, and to a certain degree, rightly so, but it seems we're, again, making military commitments based upon economic interest, not strategic military decisions. No, I think you've said it well. And a lot of times, any any place where our investments go, you know, the military follows, and it's sort of like their private private police force. But economically speaking, we encourage this. You know, we complain so much about our jobs going overseas, but we have this uh, agency called the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which means if you or I had a business and we went over, let's say we did go to a country, let's say Australia, and we start a business over there, if for political reasons or military reasons uh, we get into trouble, the taxpayers insure it. So we literally subsidize the sending out of businesses to these other countries, and if it were the market, you know, we wouldn't want to go into a country where we may get into political trouble. But if, if we go into a country and we get into political trouble and one of our businesses gets into trouble, they actually have insurance backed up by the American taxpayer. But there is there is a relationship to our business people and our military around around the world, and it incorporates a lot of activity by our CIA agents as well. One of the uh, Congressman Ron Paul is our guest. Uh, RonPaul2012.com is his website. 
Um, with regard to what our military strategies, policies would be going forward in light of the proposed cuts that are going to come out with these sequesters from the uh, super committee, um, I think a lot of people have the misconception that you're soft on the military when in actuality you have more contributions from military personnel than all the other candidates, including the president combined, if I have that correct. But yours well, is more of uh, of a strategic use of the military rather than a boots-on-the-ground global deployment. Do I have that correct? Yeah, and what we want, what I want is to restrict our military to the defense of our country, not to be the policeman of the world. Matter of fact, George Bush had a pretty good foreign policy in his campaign in the year 2000. He said we shouldn't have an arrogant foreign policy or they'll resent us. We should have a humble foreign policy. We shouldn't be the policeman of the world, and we shouldn't be a nation-building. That's pretty good stuff. But look at what's happened. And even Obama, in the campaign, pretended that he would be more that he would be more likely the peace candidate. But when they get in, they just uh, you know there's uh, they don't follow up on that. And here Obama is going into Libya without even consultation with the Congress, and uh, it's just so out of control. And that's not what the military was meant to be. Besides. It contributes to this bankruptcy of our country. Four trillion dollars that we have spent added to our debt in these last last ten years, and we don't we don't want to think about the fact that uh, we didn't. And fortunately, we didn't have to fight the Soviets, but the Soviets collapsed for economic reasons. And ironically, fighting a war in Afghanistan that they were losing. So it uh, it just bewildered me to think that people, uh, you know, are just quietly going along and they listen to this and the mem- the other candidates think this is how I'm going to get elected. The more militant I can be and the and the stronger I am and more willingness to go and start another war, the more likely I am to get elected. That um, that that makes no sense at all. Absolutely. Last question, Congressman Ron Paul is with us. Ron Paul 2012.com, the website. Uh, with regards to what we're seeing in this deadline to this, uh, I call them the dirty dozen on the Super Committee, Congressman, because they've gotten $520 million in campaign contributions since 1990. Um, uh, I would have to think that that's going to influence some of the decisions that they come up with. Uh, it doesn't look like they're going to meet the deadline. They have a 48-hour deadline before the Wednesday drop-dead date, so that makes it Monday. Here we are Thursday. Uh, it seems as if yet once again they're going to kick this can down the road, put it back into congressional committee, let them do the job that they didn't do that caused the super committee to be created in the first place. How does this end? I mean, when does this end? When do we just say stop spending and we start to get real about what our true economic problems are? Well, they're not they're not going to come up with any real cuts, and even even if they did what they were uh, asked to do, they're only cutting these proposed. Uh, increases. I think the end is going to come if if we don't have new people and a new president that's willing to cut a trillion dollars the first year. It's going to end with a financial crisis that will make 2008 look like a picnic. Uh, it'll be much, much worse. It'll be a collapse of the whole financial system, and we're going to see a rush from paper currencies because none of them are back with anything, and you're going to see an explosion of, of not only interest rates but in prices, and then we will be forced into having monetary reform. Well, let's hope that cooler heads prevail, and while we still have the time to do something uh, to head it off at the pass, uh, that we at least make steps in those directions. I know your direction is upward, punching through the 19%, and defying all those who say Ron Paul has peaked. I think there are higher elevations for you to climb to, sir. Congressman Ron Paul, continued success. Thanks for taking time to be with us on the program. I know our listeners appreciate it. Thank you, Jerry. The Jerry Doyle Show. We'll pay a few bills here, and we will come back and wrap it up. What was that song by the Fabulous Thunderbirds? Wrap it up. I'll take it. Wrap it up. We have to. Stick with us. The Jerry Doyle Show. For more information on this and other great talk programs, go to talkradionetwork.com. Small business is the engine that keeps this country running. And if you plan on being in the race for the long haul, you should consider coming to 